Christ. Welcome to worship this morning at Galloway Presbyterian Church to those gathered here in person as well as those who are at home watching through the camera. We're glad to have everyone with us today. We're especially glad to have some of Neil's family with us. Al and Robert and their parents. So, glad to have you with us today. A reminder that next Sunday is Soup Luncheon Sunday, so there's a sign-up sheet on the back there. And if you have any uh, programs, activities, things you'd like to be included in the May uh, newsletter, please let me know. I'll be working on that uh, over the next week or so. Let us prepare to worship our God. As we are able in body and spirit, let us stand and worship our God. We gather in the presence of our God. We gather as the little children of God. To worship the one who provides what we need, not what we want. We gather around the table of God. The opening hymn is number 142, all hail the power of Jesus' name.
by now how easy it is to wander from the paths of right living, aware of all the shadow valleys we wander, remembering how we have failed to place our trust in our God, how can we not come to God with our lives? Please join me as we pray together, saying, Comfort of your people. We confess the emptiness of our souls, which sends us searching for all those things which cannot nourish us. Our restless longing for the goods of the world fill us with every lust and envy. Our belief that still waters or stagnant causes us to thirst for white water thrills and adventures. Our trust in the hollow promises of our culture turns us away from the shelter you offer to us. Forgive us, goodness incarnate. Call us back from our wayward lives so we may find rest in the stillness of your gentle heart. We may find healing from your scarred hands. We may find that life for which we yearn, together in you and through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. This is the good news. God will walk with us in every moment. God will fill us with goodness and mercy. God will bring us home to live forever. For we give you with grace and forgiveness. Our lives are with the blood of the Lord people. Thanks be to God.
I learned a long time ago that some people learn by reading, some people learn by listening, some people learn by watching, some people learn by singing. And so our next hymn, number 172, is based on Psalm 23. My shepherd will supply my need. Believers have struggled for centuries to understand, to explain, to live out the unique event we call Easter. But for John, it's rather simple. It's all about love. But as John explains in other letters, this is not a rule which, if we miss the mark, causes guilt. It's that ideal for which we must continually strive. We're reading verses 16 through 24 of the third chapter of the first letter of John written centuries ago, but which still speaks to us. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. 
And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit that he has given us. Over the last few weeks, we've been reading gospel accounts about the appearances of Jesus after his resurrection. And today we go back in the gospel to listen to Jesus as a marvelous storyteller. And today he tells a story which has a deep connection with the culture of his time, his faith tradition, as well as with our song for today. We're reading verses 11 through 18 of the 10th chapter of John. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. The grass withers, the flower fades. Let us pray. And now, O Lord, whether through my words or in spite of my words, speak to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Perhaps this has happened to you. You come into a conversation that's already in progress, and as it ends, everyone begins laughing or walking away, shaking their heads, and you realize you missed what led up to that point. Maybe you've had the same thing, turning into a TV show right in the middle, or watching a movie beginning right in the middle, not realizing what led up to that particular point in the story. <clears throat> Sometimes missing crucial pieces of information keeps us from being able to understand fully what's going on. And the same can be true with some of the passages that we read on Sunday morning. What's not included in the reading <clears throat> may be of utmost importance in hearing what is going on in the lesson. For instance, in the reading from the book of Acts, we're dropped right into the middle of a trial. Peter and John are being grilled about something that has happened outside our view. It's almost like one of those intros of a TV show previously in the book of Acts. So to fully understand what is going on in this trial, we need to be reminded that as often happens in Acts, the disciples perform the same healings, the same miracles, to reflect the belief that the same ability which was seen in Jesus has now been passed on to them. Peter and John have healed a fellow who was lame. And just as they did with Jesus, the powers that be want Peter and John to give an account of why they did that. How did they manage to do that for this fellow who was lame but now walks? The same thing happens with our gospel reading today. Like any good author, John has set up this particular story back in the beginning of the eighth chapter when, he's a, when Jesus is accused of being demon-possessed and then with the healing of a blind man by the pool Siloam in chapter 9. Jesus is, as Jesus is prone to do, going around healing people, challenging people, seeking to explain to people why he does these things. 
And the reaction to him, as it always seems to be whenever he does these sort of things, is, why? The people around him asked him. They asked him of Peter and John, and of all the others throughout the centuries who have sought to invite others to become followers of Jesus. Why should we listen to Jesus? Why pay any attention to what he is trying to do in our time? In our culture? Why should we make Jesus, in the words of today's social media driven world, an influencer in our times? After all, think of all those things, all those moments, those people that compete for our attention. There's the politicians, those who are in power and those who want more power. They offer us daily sound bites, official and unofficial announcements. They use every form of social media, including some that they have created, so that we might focus more and more on their agendas rather than the real problems that face people. There's the singers and the actors and the athletes and celebrities who, because of the idol worship that they seem to inspire or hope to inspire, that we should go along with whatever they offer to us. There's the corporations who subtly and not so subtly entice us to buy more and more of their products, not because they care about us, but because they want to be able to make more money. There's family members unhappy with other family members. There's neighbors who are unhappy with the neighborhood. There's immigrants looking for some shred of dignity. There are talk show hosts who know it all. And sometimes it seems that every person who says that they follow Jesus tries to convince us that they know what's best for the church as well as for us. It shouldn't surprise us. I have that impact on kids a lot. <laughs> At every turn, with every parable, with every healing, with every meal, with every encounter, there's those folks who are offended by Jesus and are trying to get others to simply turn away from him. And in the book of Acts, these same folks are offended by what those who are following Jesus are doing and saying. And so they're trying to get people to turn away from listening to them. Today there are those folks who are trying to get us to turn away from Jesus and simply trust them with our lives. We're surrounded by people, by those who trouble us. We're deafened by those whose promises try to drown out the words of hope Jesus spoke. There are those competing, and if we are honest, sometimes compelling voices of businesses and politicians and celebrities. There's those people with loud words and angry words, dangerous words, enticing words, seducing words. We're so overwhelmed by all the notifications we get on our devices, the barrage of emails we get almost daily simply because a long time ago we bought one thing from a company and then come the calls daily, hourly. Those folks who just want to annoy us and we can find no peace, no rest, no comfort, no protection. Maybe that's why the 23rd Psalm appeals to us so much. It's written by one who in a different time and place and situation was surrounded by competing voices, people making demands of their time, surrounded all on all sides by so many troubling things. This person knew what it was like to long for some peaceful spot or to rest with no noise, no interruptions, who wanted to drink deeply from healing waters, who longed for safety, who needed someone who would give us the time, the place, the space, and simply listen to us. John, who knew this psalm as well as we do, reminds us of the one who embodies the hope, the grace, the life behind this psalm. It is the Good Shepherd, the beloved Lamb that John points us to, the one who would calm us, comfort us, cradle us. The one who will feed us and hand us jugs of living water. The one who offers to find us and carry us home. The one who will protect us, even given his life for us. 
Why should we listen to Jesus? Because of two simple words that he says in the gospel reading this morning. I am. That's it. It's that simple. Though we often forget it because we've been raised to be more New Testament people than Old Testament, these are the two very simple yet very important words in all the Bible. I am. Way back in the beginning of our story of our relationship with God, these words are spoken to a shepherd, to a murderer, to a fellow who is hidden away in the desert for 40 years, creating, trying to create a new life. Moses is out tending the flocks of his father-in-law Jethro when he sees a bush that is burning and yet it's not burnt to a crisp. He engages in a conversation with the one who tells him it is time to come out of hiding, to put aside his guilt and his shame, to step out of the overwhelming heat of the desert and walk into the cool halls where Pharaoh resides and rules. And when Moses says, well, who am I to tell them that has sent me? Who are you? Moses wants to know. And the answer is simple, I am. I am who I am. I am what I will be, just tell them, I am sent you. And for people of faith, for people of Abraham and Isaac, of Sarah and Rebecca, of Jesus and Mary, these are the only two words we need to hear, I am. So when we ask why should we listen to Jesus instead of all those compelling voices, when we wonder why we should follow Jesus instead of all the Pied Pipers of our society, when we wonder why we should trust Jesus instead of all those who claim to have our best interests at heart, the answer comes back, I am. Because the one who says I am also says, I know my own. And my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for them. You see what's being done here with these words? We are known. We are known. Which is one of the basic human needs. Most of us want nothing more than simply to be known. That is what we look for in our relationships. From the most intimate to the conversations around tables. We search for people who know us. Even as we search to know ourselves. That's why following Jesus is so important. That's why trusting Jesus makes a difference in our lives. That is why listening to Jesus sometimes needs our full attention. Those politicians, they don't care about us because they don't really know us. Those celebrities and influencers, they don't care about us. We're just numbers and the millions of views that they are trying to accumulate. The corporations, they only value us when we buy more of their products. But take heart. There is one who really does want to know us. The one who identifies as I am desires nothing more than to know us. In fact, this one already knows us as intimately as God knows him. God knows us. Period. God knows us. And because of that, we are able to know God. That's what Jesus is talking about. We can come to know God, not as a proposition, not as an argument, not as a theological discussion, but the reality of the one who loves us and knows us and comforts us. And truth, that frightens a lot of people. But it can also be revealed in the way of our lives which is what the first letter of John says, a way of life that reflects our respect to the power, the majesty, the presence of God who says, I am a life willing to lay down its life for another. Remember what John said in his letter? How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love. Not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And there it is. The answer to the questions. 
the questions posed to Jesus, the questions hurled at Peter and John, the questions that every generation has asked, the questions that many of us ask. Why should we listen to Jesus? Why pay any attention to what Jesus is doing in our culture, in our time? Why should we make Jesus, in the words of today's social media driven world, an influencer in our lives? Love. That's the answer. Perhaps love is what was revealed to Moses in that burning bush encounter. The love of the one who said, I am. The love which will rescue my people. Perhaps love is what came down to all of us that first Christmas. Perhaps love is who walked among us, teaching and healing and challenging and dying and being raised to new life. Perhaps love is the power that transformed those terrified disciples into people of unbelievable courage and faith. Love. Perhaps love is the only answer we need as to why we should follow Jesus. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We all have been gifted and blessed by our God. And we are called by our God, challenged by our God, to share from those blessings that others might know hope and grace and life and peace in their lives. As you listen to this music, let us think about those gifts.
Let us pray. Gentle shepherd, we offer our gifts to you that others might find a welcome, that we might be able to set our, aside our fears, that you might lead us into your future, that we might become the goodness and mercy for which others have been looking all their lives. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. In these moments, oh God, we would lift up our prayers of thanksgiving and praise to you for the ways in which you continue to speak to us, to be among us, to be encouraging to us and calling to us through music, ancient stories, as well as the sounds of children and the songs we sing and the conversations we have and the beauty of creation and in the silence of these moments, we would offer up those prayers of thanksgiving that we carry in our hearts and look to you. And we lift up prayers for the brokenness of our world, the nations, our communities, our lives, our families. There's so much suffering and pain and death and destruction in the world. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for peace and the resolution of the conflict between Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories, for the hostages that are held and for grieving families, for the healing of ancient enmities. We pray for all who are victims of every form of violence. We lift up Dennis Manning. We pray for Landon as well as his family. We pray for Steve Runyon, who's undergoing both chemo and radiation treatments. We pray for Harry and Sharon. We pray for Alex's mom. We pray for Sharon Blowers. We pray for Brenda Bennett, who's following her cataract surgery. We pray for Carl's sister, Helen, recovering from her surgery, as well as all those who are facing surgery, recovering surgery, undergoing tests or awaiting results of tests. We lift up all those who grieve and we pray for those who travel in these moments. And in the silence of God, we lift up those prayers of need and concern that we carry in our hearts. Lead us, creation's architect, into all those places where we will discover your hope, waiting to nourish and restore our famished souls. Lead us, shepherd of little children, into all those places where we may have the joy of filling the emptiness of others with your goodness. Lead us, spirit of goodness, into all those places where deeds of kindness and hands overflowing with mercy speak louder than platitudes. God in community, holy and one, lead us into your kingdom, even as we pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we're able in body and spirit, let us stand to conclude our worship as we sing number 106. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
meet this week. And now may the peace of the rolling waves, the peace of the silent mountains, peace of the singing stars, and the deep, deep peace of the Prince of Peace be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.